This is Patrice Wenling at the American Society of Hematology's annual meeting in Atlanta. We just heard some new data, first time looking at a targeted agent, a BTK inhibitor in CLL, um, ibrutinib. Dr. Bird, you've got a really good study here with ibrutinib. What does this do compared to the traditional um, chemotherapeutic agents? This isn't chemotherapy, so what are we looking at here? With chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy, for instance, in the older patients who have not had prior therapy, what we would expect you know, at two years is a progression-free survival between, uh, around 50%. And with ibrutinib, an oral, you know, an oral non-chemotherapy targeted drug that has a good side effect profile, we see a progression-free survival at that time point of 96%. So the results look very promising. And it's going to be important to see if this translates to you know, a big advantage in phase three studies that have started. You've also tested this in patients who are high risk with very, various mutations. Is there um, a particular advantage there? And in whom are you not seeing responses? Yeah, well, I would, I would say that ibrutinib is probably a test for who doesn't have CLL because virtually all the patients with CLL gain benefit. The, you know, where we, you know, say where we see remissions not always being sustained is in a small subset of the deletion 17P patients. The, the group, the patients that have, the, you know, the patients that are the hardest to treat, and they're still, the results that we're seeing with ibrutinib, you know, say, you know, from the data that I presented, you know, say, are better than we've seen with any other, you know, therapeutic that's come forth before this in CLL. You're seeing some very uh, favorable safety profile on this in terms of uh, immunosuppression um, and uh, infections. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, considering CLL, you know, half the patients eventually die of infections and complications of the, you know, the rate of infections with this agent, you know, say, was lower than what we would expect with traditional therapies. And, you know, in particular, we've not seen a high rate of opportunistic infections or, you know, the infections that patients with the genetic defect in, in BTK often get. It's going to really the it's going to the randomized trials that compare it to standard therapies for CLL are going to be what what are required you know, you know to be absolutely certain there's not an increased you know risk of infection or other complications but the data look good at this point. There aren't many um, drugs right now that do anything like you're describing. What's the response been from clinicians that perhaps in the trials and also those uh, from your patients? They're hearing about this. How are they responding? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, so the patients, you know, the patients that come to us and you know, we have experience at the Ohio State Comprehensive Cancer Center of treating more than 180 patients with this drug. They, they generally come sick. They go on this medicine. And, and they feel better, you know. And I say every drug has a coin, and the drug, you know, the drug that the, the, the coin that we probably have heard more than a dozen times with this drug is it makes me feel like I did before I had CLL. So for clinicians, and we've heard this, you know, other doctors at other centers have talked about this. It really makes you excited about you know bringing a drug forward that makes people feel like they don't have their cancer. These are patients that this is a disease of the elderly. Uh, they don't have a lot of time, and also these uh, data were also in groups that were at high risk. What does that mean for them? Well, e exactly. I mean, we've we, you hear a lot of talk about um, chemotherapy regimens such as FCR, which has become the gold standard frontline treatment for younger, fitter patients. But actually, the median age of, of presentation in CLL is 72. We see a lot of patients in their late 70s and 80s for whom administering a regimen like FCR is quite a challenge. Uh, and certainly more than once, um, it, it, it probably wouldn't be uh, uh, doable. So for that group of patients having a very well tolerated easy to administer treatment which they can take at home orally not having to come up and sit in a chair and have intravenous drugs is hugely attractive and then the other group you mentioned these are patients who although they may be able to tolerate something um, which is a, a chemoimmunotherapy regimen um, they may not respond very well to it and we know that there are groups of patients um, who only have short-lived remissions maybe one or two years uh, and they're destined to do very poorly um, and then there's another group of patients where we can actually identify that they're going to have problems because they have high risk, high risk cytogenetic features such as the TP53 deletional mutation where we know from quite robust trial data that they don't have as good outcomes with these um, therapies. So 
those groups of patients, you know, here's hope that something will offer them a, a durable remission where the alternatives are, are not very successful.